Welcome to the Assembly of Silence Radio Hour. My guest on this episode is Professor Sam Vaknin, author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, professor of psychology. He has a theory of physics. He speaks about economics. He speaks about politics. He has an incredibly broad scope and a fascinating and incredibly penetrating way of going about describing the world as he sees it. This is a very long conversation. I'm not going to say much more in the introduction. It was very enjoyable, very intense. I think you'll find it fascinating. Here it comes. Here we go. Sam Vaknin, thank you so much. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to do this. I was actually shocked that you were willing to do it and uh, delighted. And then we had a number of different snafus that made me wonder what the heck was going on. And uh, and here we are. So that's wonderful. And uh, and thank you once again. Thank you for having me after after all the aforementioned snafus. Yeah. So um, some of some of which were my fault, absolutely. Oh yeah, and and uh, I was on my end too. So we both had to uh, apologize to each other already, which is a great way to start a relationship. Yes, indeed, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> I uh, a long lasting one. <laughs> we'll see. You never know. You know, originally my inspiration in contacting you had to do with the video that you made about this new kind of human being that's coming into the world that's walking amongst us, you might say. Uh, and then uh, when you agreed to do this show, I started watching all the videos that you sent me and a bunch of other ones and uh, realizing the scope of your work, which is immense and you might say even comprehensive in a certain way. So uh, that's left me with uh, way too much that I would love to speak with you about. And so in some respects, I feel like maybe it would be interesting to start at the end, which would be uh, what I take as being your solution to the various problems that you uh, elucidate so clearly. And if I'm not mistaken, that might be summarized by the word nothingness. And you know, I guess my first question would be, well, am I getting that correctly? Nothingness is uh, an extension of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's concept of authenticity. Hmm. Sartre had suggested in the 40s and 50s that we actually go through life acting parts. We imitate. Life is mimicry. This idea was later ex extended by other French thinkers, such as Guy Debord, who suggested that society in general is a, major, is a massive spectacle. It's a, it's a, a theater show production. And so there was this Shakespearean, Shakespearean, uh, if you wish, you or Shakespearean strand in thinking that the world is a stage and we are, we are all actors. And, and Sartre railed against it. He said, you should stop acting. You should be yourself. It is only via, via agency, self-autonomy, and via uh, the angst, via the anxiety of having to choose having to decide. It is only through this that you can subsist and exist authentically. And it is only when you exist authentically that you exist at all. Otherwise you are nothing but a simulation, an imitation, mimicry, simulacrum. There were many, many terms bandied about in the 60s and 70s. So nothingness is an extension of this because what I suggest is that if one does elect, does choose to, to live authentically, one has to first and foremost suspend huge parts of oneself. Because big parts of you are actually determined and predetermined by the process of socialization and acculturation. Big parts of you are not you. Big parts of you, for example, are what we call in psychology introjects. Voices of parents, parental figures, voices of role, role models, voices of teachers, of peers, influential peers. These voices are inside your head. They're known as internal objects. And they determine an inordinate amount of your decision-making process, choices, and so on. You, you, 
maintain the illusion of free will. You maintain the illusion of, of choice, but actually you are to a very large extent pre-programmed and predetermined by society via its agents of socialization. So this is something that Sartre neglected to mention, neglected to tackle, because he stopped at the point of don't, don't imitate, don't act, don't assume a role which is not you. But I went a step, or I tried to go a step further and say, well, if I really, really choose to be only and exclusively me, I need to shed many skins. I need to shed the skin of society. I need to shed my introjects. I need to shed expectations. I need to shed mores. I need to shed values. I need to, sh I need to shed so many things that finally, when push comes to shove at the crux of it, nothing is left behind. Hmm. And this is, the, this is the idea of nothingness. Would it be the case that, uh, let's say for you know, an unrealistic example, that, that the world took the prescription and everyone was able to practice this uh, shedding of introductions and uh, false selves, would we be a social animal then? Would we be able to maintain societies? It's one of the great myths, which myths that are propagated by elites throughout, throughout human history. Elites, of course, are self-interested groups. They're not necessarily coordinated as conspiracy theorists with, would have, but they are self-interested and the self-interests coalesce and converge. So they all seem to be coordinated, but they're not. At any rate, elites have the vested interest to convince us that the only way to act socially is by succumbing to socialization. In other words, the only way to function in society is to be indoctrin indoctrinated, not to say brainwashed. It's the only way. And conforming to a limited set of directives, expectations, and so on and so forth. This is, of course, utter nonsense, utter unmitigated nonsense. There is a clear distinction between external variables such as values, mores, beliefs, faiths, and so on, and our capacity to act as social animals. How do I know? Because values and so on change throughout history. They are not immutable. The values of the Middle Ages have nothing to do with our values today. The mores of ancient, ancient Greece have little to do with the mores of current day Germany, etc. In other words, these are not fixtures, they are, they are changeable. They, they, so, and so we can't say that our nature as a social animal, which is immutable, is biologically determined. We can't say that this relies on things that change every generation. That would be ridiculous. Well, might it be that they rely upon not the specific form of the thing itself, but rather the fact that there is some kind of value or more being practiced or observed to some degree. Our capacity to act as social animals depends crucially on coordination, yeah. on, on synchronization, and on mutual goal attainment. So we do have to negotiate goals. We don't have to, to negotiate goals, that's true. And then we have to decide, settle on procedures for ob obtaining these goals, securing these goals. But that's where it starts and where it ends. Everything else are artificially imposed layers. And if you study these layers, if you deconstruct them, as was the case in the 60s and 70s, when they deconstructed these layers, they discovered that actually these layers are self-interested, are, are, the, are the outcome of the self-interest of very well-defined elites. They want you to believe in these layers because these layers enhance their wealth, increase their power, ensure their ascendance and control and dominance and hegemony. I mean, these, these extra layers are, are not essential, absolutely not essential. 
is it also the case that uh, that on some level you might say globalization proves this case because of course there are many different participants, each of which have a different set. Well, not each of which, but there are many different mores and values involved in that process. And I guess to the extent that we might be willing to say that globalization is a success, and maybe it isn't, uh, we uh, we could say, well, here's a perfect example of us operating and accomplishing goals without having. A, a common set of values and mores amongst us. I'll come to it in a minute, but before I do, what what the elites had done, it, it, when I say elites, I mean also intellectual elites, not necessarily the plut plutocrats or, I mean, intellectual elites are actually more responsible than anyone else. So what they had done, they had dislocated the reward. They told you, listen, it's not enough to collaborate. It's not enough to secure goals. You need to feel good about it. And the only way to feel good about it is if you listen to us, if you obey our rules, if you adopt our values, if you accept our mores, if you succumb to expectations. That's the only way to feel good about being a social animal. But actually, the very act of collaboration and goal attainment is pleasurable. It, in, it is its own reward. Hmm. You don't need anything else. You don't need a meta, meta narrative. You don't need this piece of fiction that is superimposed on the essential act. It's like I would tell you, listen, you want to enjoy sex? You can enjoy sex only by doing sex in a highly specific way, which conforms to a set of procedures, etc., etc. That's, of course, ridiculous, because sex is its own reward. <laughs> it's autonomous of any narrative, you know? That's a beautiful so example. Globalization is a great example. And I think the Internet is another example. Hmm. before it had been corrupted and co-opted. The internet was exactly this, this kind of idea, that collaboration and goal attainment are their own rewards, and we don't need overriding superimposed narratives to render what we do meaningful and therefore pleasurable. And of course, this, there's a, an open question of what is meaning and so on, but generally speaking. Well, how does this interface with uh, what we might call meaning crisis? Because it seems that one of the byproducts of the present age is this sense of uh, aimlessness and lack of purpose that you identify as being one of the primary characteristics of this new human. So is there a way in which we're seeing perhaps as a byproduct of um, a globalized world where there is no clearly defined set of of values, and it is uh, primarily on the basis of those who are able to take initiative to uh, achieve their goals, uh, that maybe in that kind of hash, the whole thing uh, ends up with a lot of people feeling like they don't know why they're here or what they're supposed to be doing. Of course, there are some underlying assumptions in your, in your question. First, one, one underlying assumption is if you don't, if you don't know wh why you're here, and what it is that you're doing here, that's bad. That's a nomic. <laughs> that's a problem. That's true. That's assumption number one. Assumption number two is that we can derive meaning and the pleasure of meaning only via meta-narratives or ulterior discourses, such as, for example, religion or, you know, the family or institutions and so on. And that is, of course, exactly what the elites want you to think. The truth is that the reason we are in a crisis of meaning is because the way we, con the way we think about the concept of human being had changed dramatically over the last, shall we say, 60 years. Hmm. Up until 60 years ago, we considered people, human beings, as the intersections of relationships. So human beings were like Venn diagrams. There were two circles, and the area common to both circles was you. We defined the human, the human, we defined the human being as the, as the outcome of interactions between other human beings. And then 60 years ago, we started to develop modern personality theory. And we came with the amazing concept and counterfactual concept and nonsensical concept of the individual. Now, individualism as a philosophical strand 
had been in existence for two, three hundred years. But the individualism of the Puritans, for example, has nothing to do with the modern conception of, in, of the individual. Because the, the Puritan individual who was rebellious, who was uh, free thinking and so on, that's where that's why they had to escape to the United States. Mm -hmm. The Puritan individual was deeply embedded in his community, defined himself by his relationships to others and to God. He, he happened to believe in God. Yeah? Believed that everything that's happening in his life has meaning by virtue of being embedded in these networks, imaginary abstract networks. This was the concept of individual. This was individualism then. 60 years ago, there was a revolution in psychology, and I blame psychology a lot for what's happening. There was a revolution in psychology, and suddenly the definition of individual had changed. The individual now become an, became an atom. We started the process of atomizing society. Everything became endogenous. Everything came from the inside, not from the outside. Our definition of the individual had transitioned from relational to self-subsisting, self-sufficient, self-contained. In other words, solipsistic. Hmm. We developed a solipsistic view of the individual. And so this created a series of outcomes. Marx had the foresight to predict the concept of alienation. He de described alienation. And then there was a whole group of neo-Marxist thinkers, such as Louis Althusser and others, and they described this. So when you are all alone and when you are self-sufficient and when you are self-contained, you are atomized, you have no relationships of any consequence, and of course you can't have meaning because meaning is always external. You cannot derive meaning internally, which is the nonsense that self-help books are trying to sell you. Meaning is always external, always relational. It's always been a network, not a node. Right. Only we transitioned from networks to nodes. And this was disastrously calamitous. And now to go back, I don't know how. I am not sure how to go back. When you, when you adopt nothingness as a form of authenticity, what happens is you are open to reintegrate in these vast networks. You're open to reintegrate because you don't have defenses. You don't have resistance. You are not invested in any ego uh, functions that are exclusionary. You're not, it's not ego death, by the way. Ego death is a distortion of, of, of uh, Eastern thinking by Western wannabe gurus. Yeah. It's not ego death. It's, it's an entirely different concept, but it simply means that by, by reducing yourself to the core bare minimum, you, you feel utterly free to get integrated with other people because you don't have the defenses and the resistances which prevent you from doing so nowadays. And all these defenses and resistances are imported from culture and society. The concept of society is a modern concept. It was brought on by Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the 18th century. There was no such concept before. It's totally modern. The concept of culture is a totally modern concept. Rome had something akin to civilization, and they had a vague notion of civilization. But it was to totally inclusionary civilization. If you were black, if you were a Jew, if you were a Namibian, I mean, you could be a Roman. It was not a problem. It was totally inclusionary. Everything we do today is exclusionary and atomized because we are being taught, mainly by psychology, that this represents reality. It's a good, it's a proper understanding and rendition of reality. We are taught reality is like this. You are individual, indivisible, like an atom, you know, and you should behave as an atom. It fits the particle physics model. Yes. Are you familiar with uh, Adam Curtis's films? He made a a, a film called the, uh, the Century of the Cell. Century of the Cell. Yeah, and yes. that seems to suggest uh, in, uh, another way of expressing what you're saying that, in some respects, it was uh, psychology was used by uh, the powers that be in order to control large numbers of people, and and that's pretty much exactly Psycho psychology was co-opted. 
Psychology was yeah. co-opted, absolutely. First of all, it became first of all it became an industry. So there's a lot, there are many billions, <laughs> billions and tens of billions riding, riding on this proposition that you are self-sufficient and self-contained, that you have magical powers, that if you just put your mind to it, you can do anything and you can make the world do anything. There's a lot of money riding on these nonsensical idiocies, you know? <laughs> and and money speaks, money talks. And bullshit walks. That's the outcome. <laughs> I think that at some point I heard you say in one of the videos that money is a substitute for love. So it's kind of interesting uh, that the driving force behind the psychological reframing of human existence would be a, uh, a kind of pale substitute for what was the thing that actually did bind people together. Um, money is a very money is a very problematic example because, for example, the Puritans believed that money is proof of God's love. Mm -hmm. If you are prosperous, it shows that God loves you, God favors you. So money had always always had maintained this undertone of love, cosmic love, divine love, love among people, and so on and so forth. To this very day, we transact love by money via money i mean father gives you an allowance it shows his love it's this is this is a way we we express and reify reify love mm. but of course you are absolutely right that money has very very little to do with love corrupts love and misrepresents love because love is about being separate that is a huge huge error and mistake in modern psychology and in self help books the self-help books, especially especially mm. dating uh, dating coaches and all the, I mean, they give you the impression that to fall in love means effectively to merge, to fuse mm. with another person. To fall in love or to be in love or to love another person is to recognize the separateness of that person, the autonomy of that person, and to interact in ways that enhance both of you via your separateness. Love is about being separate. Now, money brings people together. It, therefore, money is a bad rendition and reification of love. Money is the opposite of love. Money brings people together. Love sets them apart. True love sets them apart. This is exactly opposite of what you've been talking about. That's really interesting. There's a Taoist formulation that uh, that's pretty interesting that seems to relate to that. They say that... Uh, when the Tao was lost, there came harmony. And when harmony was lost, then came love. Because, of course, it's the differences between us that make love possible. Harmony just means everyone's playing their role without en any entropy. kind of friction. Harmony, harmony yeah. is ent entropy. Harmony is entropy, a form of entropy. Oh, interesting. Huh. They go on to say that when love is lost, then there's justice. And when justice is lost, then there's ritual. Ritual. No, I know. I, I made a video about Buddhism, Taoism, and, and uh, nothingness, by the way. Yeah, it seems like there, there would be some real deep correlation there, although you identify a main difference as uh, that it not being ego death, which I don't think was really a concept in, in Taoism or Buddhism. Was not. Absolutely not. It's a really distortion not. by Western, distortion yeah, by Western seems, wannabe gurus. Pop, pop sci, right? Popular psychology type of deal. Yeah. It's um, popular money making. I didn't do with right. psychology. <laughs> <Money> <laughs> so you refer to psychology in general as a pseudoscience too, I believe, which, which is also uh, an incredibly interesting framing for a psychology professor to make. Um, how, it, not, you know, you have this kind of corrupting influence of money on one hand, and then you have the question of the basic infrastructure. What is it that the, the process is? What is this endeavor of psychology? And uh, one of the things that I've wondered, because, of course, you focus a great deal on narcissism, which has its own kind of history of meaning. Uh, would you say that psychology is in itself a kind of form of narcissism because it, it's it's like humanity in the aggregate becoming obsessed with itself or at least its idea of itself the reflection that it appears at, and thinks of as itself 
First of all, allow me to compliment you on your questions. They are deep and, and fascinating. Before, you. with your permission, you. be, it's, it's a fact. Before, uh, before we go there, and I will, I will respond to your question. I just said a passing thought, which I think might be of interest to you and, and to your viewers and listeners. I think the internet is an example of this clash, this inevitable clash uh, between nothingness and, and, let's say, psychology. I think the enemy of nothingness is psychology, to be clear. So the internet is an example because the internet simultaneously is about being embedded in networks. It's a network technology, physically, but it also encourages and enhances networking among people. That's how it started in universities. So on the one hand, on the other hand, it renders you totally self-sufficient and self-contained. You don't need anyone. You can publish books by yourself. You can make videos by yourself. I mean, you don't need anyone. It encourages atomization. It encourages the individual view. Mm -hmm. I am all, I'm, an, I'm a self-encompassed universe. It's a very solipsistic technology, which ironically tries to prompt you to integrate with other people who are atomized and solipsistic. <laughs> there is an inherent contradiction in this technology, which, by the way, is a time bomb, and in my view, would render it sooner or later obsolete. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds entirely insane, but I don't think this technology can, can be maintained and preserved in the long run because there is an internal contradiction in its design. Its very design is problematic. But you asked about psychology. Psychology is uh, like many other things that we take for granted. We think they, they are eternal, Psycho like society. Society is a modern invention. Childhood, childhood is a modern invention. There were no children until the 19th century, you know? What were they? What were these children? Young men and young women. Young men, young women. Do you remember Louise, Louise May Alcott's? What's the title of her book? Louise May Alcott. I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, uh, she has, she has, she's written a series of books, and one of them is called Young, young Women, and one of them is called young, young Men. And she's talking about children. Hmm. So Dickens never uses the word child. In, in any of his books. Wow. Charles Dickens. That's, that's, that's 19th century. Right. So childhood is a very modern concept. Motherhood is a modern concept. Romantic love is a modern concept. All these things that look to us eternal have been with us since the inception of history. They're actually 100 years old. So is psychology. Mm -hmm. Psychology was invented almost precisely 130 years ago. Out of the blue, there have been books about the human condition, books about moods, for example, about melancholy. Burton wrote about melancholy. There have been books. But as a discipline, it's 130 years old. And it was a pretension to science from the very beginning. It sprang out of laboratories. German, how else? Laboratories. Mm. And then American. So, and uh, when, Sigmund when Freud... When the Americans got their hands he, on the Germans. When the Americans finally got their hands on the Germans and then never let go for 50 years. <laughs> and Sigmund Freud thought that he was inventing a physics of the mind. That's why he called it psychoanalysis. Uh -huh. It was analytical. He thought it's a science of the mind. So it was all very scientific and very respectable. Sigmund Freud was a neurologist. Seven of the 10 most important psychologists in human history were not psychologists at all. They were pediatricians. They were neurologists. They were anything but psychologists. <laughs> so... Psychology has two, has many, but has two major problems. Number one, it deals with fictions, fictions such as the individual, such as the ego, such as the mind, such as consciousness. And it treats these fictions as though they were not fictions, but real life entities. This happens to be delusional disorder <laughs> under the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Psychosis, actually. Psychology is a bit of a psychotic pseudoscience because it deals exclusively with entities that are totally abstract and have no validation in any way, shape, or form, as opposed to physics. I'm a physicist, by the way, by training. 
as opposed to physics, where we do have abstract entities such as quarks, but we have a lot of indirect verification of their existence, or they are useful theoretical constructs. In, in psychology, everything, literally every single thing you ever heard of is total invention, which cannot be substantiated, falsified, refuted, proved, analyzed in any way, shape, form, with any instrument or any design of any experiment. End of story. There is no experiment you can design to prove the existence of consciousness or the mind. None. It is based 100% on self-reporting. So this is problem number one. Problem number two. When I, as a physicist, deal with the sun, when I deal with the sun, the sun is supposedly an objective entity. It's there. I can revisit it. I can re replicate the experiment as many times as I want. And I will keep getting the same answer, statistically speaking. But when I analyze you as a test subject, you are not the same. If I test you today and I conduct the very same test tomorrow, you are no longer the same subject. You know what? You're no longer the same subject a second after I conduct the test. You know what? The very fact that I'm conducting a test on you changes you. We don't have, we don't have in psychology entities to study because the entities are kaleidoscopic. They change every split second. What are we testing? What are we experimenting on? Shape-shifting sands, you know? Isn't there a somewhat similar problem within physics? Because, you know, the double slits experiment, and again, there's a whole sort of popular psychology interpretation of that, but it does seem that fundamentally what it's saying is that once you start to probe a system, you change that system. So I know, you know, there's this whole observation thing, which I think is misleading because it's not as if we're observing these things by just uh, looking at it without interacting with the system. The observation takes place with the use of an instrument, which of course is sending a, a signal. And so once you perturb a system, fundamentally it's sort of like chaos theory takes over and there's the collapsing of the wave function. And then you get some particular idea out of the uh, interaction, but you end up changing the system the same way like uh, long-term capital management thought that they understood the market, right? And so they, uh, they got themselves in a lot of trouble because their activities were so successful, they ended up changing the way the whole market functioned. So it seems like, you know, that, that's kind of a general principle of nature, is it not? Any study of any system uh, that is microscopic, uh, changes it because we have to probe particles with photons and the photons carry energy and, and perturb the particles. So this is nothing to do with a double slit experiment. It has to do with the uncertainty principle or principles. There's a series of principles. So what, what it says is that when you study micro entities such as particles, for example, you can determine only one of their properties because the very experiment prohibits you, prevents you from getting a full, a full specification of all their properties. In other words, if you bomb, if you bomb a particle with a photon, the, the photon will move the particle. So you can't determine the position of the particle. That's an example, yes? Now, the difference between um, quantum physics or quantum mechanics and uh, psychology is that in quantum mechanics, we can and do specify all the possible outcomes with absolute certainty. Now, we cannot tell you which outcome will ultimately materialize. That's what, what you refer to, the collapse of the wave function. But we can definitely describe the total space of all possible outcomes. And there will not be an outcome out, outside this total space, ever. Hmm. And that's the difference. You cannot do this with human beings. Hmm. Simply, you cannot do this. Moreover, with my macroscopic systems, which are the majority of human experience, like the sun, the earth, a tree, we don't have this problem. Our experiments do not change the system. If I observe the sun, trust me, I don't change it. Hmm. Or I change it so minimally that it's meaningless. So on a macroscopic, and human beings are macroscopic. 
So if I observe the sun and I observe you, it's an entirely different outcome. When I observe you, by observing you, I'm changing you, and then you change internally. There are endogenous processes over which I have no control. It's another very important thing. When I conduct an experiment in physics, any experiment in physics, I control the environment totally. I cannot do this with a human being because human beings have internal processes to which I have zero access. The first thing I don't have access to is your mind. We are trapped in our minds. The only mind I have access to is mine. I can never have access to your mind. I have to rely, in other words, about, I have to rely, rely on your self-reporting. What if you're a liar? What if you're psychotic? What if you're a psychopath? What if you're delusional? What if you had too much to drink last night? It's a problem. I have to rely on self-reporting. I don't have, like in physics, objective ways to probe you. This is nonsense. Psychology can never, ever be a science. Ever, by definition, because of the subject matter. Might we say that the internet is an effort to, uh, to create a, uh, a contained enclosure within which the probing of the human mind can be measured? And, uh, and that perhaps that effort, um, if, if what you're saying is correct, uh, will, uh, will fail uh, because of that fundamental unpredictability of what we refer to as consciousness. And that, and that you're continually, by probing, going to change the, uh, the behavior and, and maybe the signals will no longer really make sense after a while. I think is that, is that kind of how this whole thing collapses, perhaps? We're not probing. We cannot probe the human mind by definition. The human mind is close to us. Your mind is close to me totally. I have to rely on your self-reporting. And you may be a robot, a sophisticated robot sent from the future. I have no idea, nor can I ever prove it. I cannot prove you're human. You, only you know that. Only you have access. Right. What the internet does, what the internet does is it manipulates. It provides input and output. It's, it's a black box. The internet is a black box. You see all the inputs and you see all the outputs. There was a book published a few years ago, a billion, a billion wicked thoughts. It analyzed the keyword searches for sex. What keywords people use uh, in sexual search, in searches related to sex. And then it, it e extrapolated these, these searches and it said, well, based on these keywords, this is the sexual world of people. This is, this is the world of sexuality. Huh. which was, of course, wrong. <laughs> right. keywords, keywords can teach you about keywords. Keywords can teach you everything about keywords. They can right. teach you nothing, nothing about sexuality. So maybe the presumption was that the feedback mechanism, because basically all clicks can be uh, logged and analyzed, would provide another layer of analysis when it comes to a reporting on the state of the being. And, and, I guess suppose you know there would be the initial inquiry. Uh, what does this mean to you? And you're saying, well, you have liars, you have psychopaths, and that's not going to be. So you'd have more sophisticated experiments where you would measure things uh, without uh, specifically querying about them. Um, so an indirect measurement, and then the fact that you know people are on the internet all the time, and so their kind of generalized behavior is being measured. Uh, seems to go a layer deeper, but you're saying that fundamentally it's still just a, a surface behavioral type of thing. And everyone's aware they're being you monitored should. now, so that probably changes an awful lot of behavior too. You should never confuse input and output with the black box operations. Never. It's like confusing the signal from a television with the work with the workings of the television. Right. The television gives you a signal. It's visual. It's audio. It's captivating, especially if you have Netflix, but it's not, it's not television. It's not the television. Right. What do you know about you? What do you know about your television? Nothing. The you medium. know nothing about your television. The medium is the message. You, you, uh, I mean, most people and, and some disciplines confuse input and output with a black box that's in between. And we have this tendency, by the way, in politics, in psychology, everywhere, we have this tendency to confuse input and output with the real thing. 
Input and output are never reality itself. They are ways of interacting with reality, but they are never reality. Never, so, ever. Emergent properties of the black box. So that, that kind of uh, brings into question um, the, the nature of consciousness itself. There's a, there's a model that suggests that uh, we are actually more like receivers than generators of consciousness and that the, the, the mind is essentially tapping into some sort of basic attribute of the universe, if you like, as, uh, as in the same way that a radio is tapping into the, the signals being generated by a, uh, by a, a transmitter. Do you, uh, do you think there's any validity to that concept, which is, I think, in some ways integrated with, with some of the uh, ideas in Taoism and, and Buddhism? I have no idea what is mind. I have absolutely no idea what is consciousness. I have no idea what is the soul. I don't know what is a spirit. I have no idea what is God. I don't think anyone has an, an idea what is God. People tend to use words. And words of meaning only if they have lexical definitions, at least, at least lexical, also contextual, also historical, also, you know, but at least lexical. Can you define consciousness? Because I can't. I have a PhD in philosophy. I, I can't define consciousness. Well, I've taken a crack mind. at it. <laughs> and, you know, of course, okay. ideas, we have ideas about things without not having knowledge about things. So we can, you know, obviously many different constructions have occurred in an effort to try to get a grip on things that we don't know about. And it makes sense to do that because there's so many things we don't know about. You know, the realm of what can be knowable, you know, you have uh, Zizek loves to talk about uh, the Donald Rumsfeld kind of model of, uh, of knowledge. And uh, you have your known knowns, your unknown knowns, you have your unknown unknowns, and you have your known unknowns. And so most of it is unknown, really, when it comes down to it. And it's hard to say what the percentage would be, but I would hazard to guess that really most of, most of what's going on is in the unknown category one way or another. So we have to grapple with it one way or another. And, and you know, constructing an idea, even if it can't be known, is Why? the best we can do. Why do I, we don't, well, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's the question. I guess we could just abide in nothingness, right? I mean, why do we have to grapple with it? I have no problem going through my life um, happily <laughs> without having a first inkling what is mind and what is consciousness. Moreover, if you discuss mind and consciousness without knowing what it is, if you discuss the unknown, mm -hmm. you are actually um, dealing, you're actually dealing tautologies. You're not discussing mind, you're discussing your discourse of mind. When you're debating yeah. with me about the mind and we both don't know what mind is, we are actually debating your contribution to the discourse and my contribution to the conversation. We are, in other words, dealing with language. Yeah. The confusion between language and essence is the bane and the curse of modern uh, non-exact non, non sciences. Hmm. I mean, psychology, sociology, philosophy, th that's the major, major issue. We talk about things we have no idea of, like mind and consciousness, and then we analyze the things we said about them. <laughs> and this becomes a discipline. This becomes a discipline. <laughs> and everyone argues and deconstructs and reconstructs, and everyone is very happy because they feel they're getting somewhere. <laughs> but they're analyzing the speech acts. They're analyzing the language, not the essence, never the essence. So even if we drill down on the terms, we, we can't escape that. Is that true? You can't, you can't say anything meaningful about something you know nothing about. That's a maxim. I repeat this. You cannot say anything meaningful about something you have no idea about. Can, can you say something beautiful? You can say, exactly, you can say something aesthetic, you can say something meaningful about what you said about the thing that you know nothing about. Mm -hmm. So you can, have, you can have meta levels, you can discuss the discussion, and then you can discuss the discussion of the discussion, and so on and so forth. These are nested, nested representations, self-referential systems. I refer you to Hofstetter's magisterial book, Gödel Escher Bach. 
Mm. A wonderful book if you hadn't read it. I mean, Rush by Stunning. Uh, one I of the greatest it, yeah, my, I could not make my way through stunning it. Stunning book. Yeah. Absolutely stunning book. It's, it's one of the things he says. We are actually trapped. Most of our most of our current thinking is we talk about our speech acts. We discuss and dissect and analyze. And we refer to language as an entity when it's not. So when I when you and I discuss the mind, we I mean you can say something about the mind, and then we're going to criticize what you said about the mind, and you're going to criticize my criticism. But are we talking about the mind? <laughs> no, we are not. We are talking about what we had said about the mind. Is this the mind? Blind men with the elephant. It, it goes way back, right? In a way, in a way. But there was an elephant there. I'm not well, sure mind exists. <sighs> Well, how would we how would we navigate without the cognitive facility? You know, the, the we, we have something going on here that allows for this uh, interchange to occur. We formulate mind objects, whether they're interjected or formulated ourselves. Uh, so something is there, and and it it certainly provides us with you know, let's say, distraction and entertainment while we're waiting to pass to the grave. So that doesn't seem to be such a bad thing. There's a lot of other things we could be doing with our time. Maybe it would be better, but uh, I find it interesting, engaging, and to some extent enriching. Um, you know, maybe that's just my uh, imagination. Uh, but we all have our preferences, I suppose. You know, there, you could go for a run now instead, and it might be more healthy. But uh, but it's a pastime, you know, and and it's it's better than. Uh, <sighs> I don't know, mugging people. I mean, there's a lot of different things people could do. So I don't see anything inherently, uh, I mean, it's maybe ridiculous, but, uh, but I don't see anything inherently wrong with it. Uh, <laughs> and, and on some level, it is what we're engaged in. I mean, I've watched a lot of your videos and, and of course you're dealing with a wide range of different concepts and it's a, a very uh, rigorous intellectual exercise and it's uh, a lot of fun and incredibly interesting. So, so what the heck, you know, let's go for this ride and, and see, uh, see where it leads. Again, again, everything you've just said has to do with input and output, not with a black box. You just described a series of activities, series mm -hmm. of exchanges, words, which are language elements. It's all input and output. We can, if you wish, discuss the input and output. Absolutely. That's a rigorous intellectual exercise. Because these are entities. I don't right. dispute that. Our conversation is an entity. The words we exchange, is they are entities. They have lexical meanings. They provoke in us, they evoke in us uh, non-lexical meanings as well. Associations, as Freud called them. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these are entities. But the black box is what you call the mind. I don't, I'm not even sure it exists. Maybe, for example, maybe... Our brains are programmed, pre-programmed, to react in highly specific way to highly specific sequences of words. If this were true, we don't need a mind. It's a superfluous assumption. So if our well, brains are pre-programmed, we don't need a mind. Yeah, but of course, that's a construction as well. The black box is a black box. And so whatever it is no, that we're going to no, say about it. No, 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 that's a brain. Brain is a physical entity. Well, yeah, but I'm saying that particular mechanism, if, that, if that's the mechanism that you, you just described one possible this. mechanism. No, 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 that's a scientific assumption, a scientific hypothesis, because I can test it. For example, I can stimulate brain areas when I talk to you and see whether you give specific answers all the time. Well, but so how, do you can, know whether you're interfering, how do you know whether you're interfering with the mind or just with the output? Like, you know, the, the capacity for the mind to... Forget to, the mind, forget the mind. Press. I take your brain, forget the mind now. Mm -hmm. You don't need the mind. It's like Blaise Pascal... When okay, Napoleon no, no, asked him, black box. So there's a black box, and you're you're probing it, and when when you're when you're trying to, uh, I'm not probing. I'm, you're, you're not listening. Okay, you're not sorry. listening. I'm not probing the black box. I'm probing your brain. Your brain is not a black box. It's an object. Okay, right. So if I st if I stimulate your brain, and every time I stimulate, I say A, you say B, then I know your brain is pre-programmed. I don't think it is. Don't misunderstand me. But I'm saying here's a hypothesis. Right. That can be is, is a scientific one. It's testable. It's falsifiable. And maybe it's also true. We don't know because we never tried it. 
when Blaise Pascal, um, when Blaise Pascal uh, gifted his work to Napoleon, Napoleon leafed through the pages and said, uh, where's God in all this? And Pascal said, God was an unnecessary assumption in my work. Huh. This is my answer to you. This is my answer to you. Mind and consciousness are unnecessary assumptions in my work. Hmm. I don't need them. I don't need them because I have no idea what they are, exactly as I don't need God and such other nonsense. <laughs> I don't need these things. There is a principle, there is a principle in, um, in the philosophy of science. It's known as parsimony, the principle of parsimony. It's also known as Occam's razor. You need to construct scientific theories with a minimal number of entities and a minimal number of assumptions. Right. If you can explain the world without God, that's a much better scientific theory than a theory that incorporates God. If I can explain everything without mind and without consciousness, I should. That's what a scientist is obliged to do. And the answer is, I can. I don't need the mind and consciousness. And of course, constructs like ego and this, I mean, they are totally, <laughs> totally fictitious and pieces of literature. They're not science. Hmm. Um, well, what about Pascal's wager, right? He, uh, I think, famously said, well, we may not know whether or not God exists, but we may as well assume that, that he does, because it would be a real pity if uh, we got that wrong. That's the foundation of the insurance insurance industry. <laughs> I'm, all, I'm always for hedging your bets. It's also, that does admit a, a whole realm of, of things that we might otherwise dispense with, right? There are always there are always contingencies and possibilities and potentials, and my my new work in physics is is founded on this very concept of that the, the reality is, is a set of potentialities. So there's always, there's always a potential for a God. That's not the question a scientist should ask. A scientist should ask, can I explain the world without God? And if I can, I need to dispense with this because it's a superfluous assumption. If it is the case that one of the primary um, features of existence is something akin to consciousness, then wouldn't a physical model have to take consciousness into uh, account? Because uh, if, if Again, consciousness... I don't understand what you're asking. I don't well, know what is consciousness. I well, can't relate to your question. Consciousness is the thing that makes uh, it different when you're probing a physical system versus a, uh, a network of human beings. So you have a, the predictable outcome when you're dealing with uh, a, a controlled experiment where it's just a physical basis. And then you have this entirely different set of issues that arise when you're probing living things, which have the capacity to produce, well, a variety of responses instead of a particular set of responses. You don't explain, you don't explain scientific problems by introducing undefined terms. <laughs> There's not the way. So you say, I have problems experimenting with human beings, let me introduce a meaningless word, consciousness, and that will solve the problem. That will explain it. It's because it's meaningless, it doesn't help. But if we know that there are uh, things that are outside of our uh, ability to understand, then shouldn't we have some kind of representation of them uh, in a complete way? If, if they are outside our ability to, to understand, then we cannot have a representation of them. Because they're right. outside our ability well, to Well, you can have, you can have uh, some kind of a module that basically says, okay, there's this thing here, and we don't know exactly what it's doing, but, uh, but it does produce a set of results that are different from what we can physically it cannot model. Produce anything. It cannot produce anything if you cannot prove its existence and understand what it is. It's a meaningless sentence. Hmm. I'm sorry, I'm a scientist. You know, I, I completely understand. And I, I think this is a, a, a path that we, we would, you know, kind of, continue to uh, just, you know, not be able to come to any kind of real meaningful agreement about, but, uh, but a really fascinating area nonetheless. But let's just move it along for a little bit. Um, sure. The, one of the things that you're talking about a lot is the extent to which uh, 
narcissism, narcissism in particular, but if I understand what you're saying correctly, uh, a variety of mental illnesses is kind of uh, an epidemic. We're seeing a pandemic, if you like, and this is the model that you use. You, you explicitly say that this is very much like a virus and that humanity is infected with a variety of mental illnesses. And, and so, you know, the, the question that I uh, have has to do with if you have a society which is increasingly mentally ill, and doesn't really necessarily recognize it, and that this is happening at the highest levels of society, then, you know, is the species essentially mentally ill? Do, are, are we an insane species? Is humanity insane? Have we lost our minds? <laughs> you know? yeah. Here's the conundrum. If all of us become mentally insane, that would be sanity. Hmm. So, uh, psychology is based on statistics. We use the word normal. Normal is a word borrowed from statistics. Mm. So if all of us become narcissists, narcissists is a new normal. And then if you're not a narcissist, you're mentally ill. Right. It's as simple as that. So is that akin to uh, entropy? It's akin to, it's akin to zo a zombie apocalypse. Hmm. If all of humanity becomes zombies, the few remaining humans would be considered misfits, miscreants, and probably relegated to mental asylums. Is this a, a so, historical process that repeats itself over and over again? Are we continually kind of losing our minds and then, you, know, uh, you might say, ratcheting up the level of insanity? I would put it differently. We, at different times, different, different periods and different places, different cultures, different societies, we have differing models of, norm of normalcy, of what is normal. So, for example, in Nazi Germany, it was utterly normal to be a psychopath. And it was a positive adaptation. And if you were not a psychopath, you were mentally ill. For example, if you were helping Jews, if you were helping the Jews, hiding Jews in your home, you're insane. You, you needed help. You needed medication. Something was wrong with you. You know? So, in different, time, different times and different places, you have different models of normalcy. For example, in the United States right now, the model of normalcy is essentially narcissistic and gradually becoming psychopathic, gradually. So narcissism and psychopathy are becoming... Oops, I think you went online. You see that as being uh, circumscribed to the United States or a more of a global type of process? Well, the, the, the United States is, is global. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. there are transmission vectors via mass media, social media and so on, which are essentially American. Uh, controlled in American inventions. And so these transmission mechanisms are very fast and the globe is infected with the American disease. Absolutely. But yes, it started in America. It's the, it's the American virus, not the Chinese virus. <laughs> but, but this is the new, this is the new normal. And in July, 2016, the, the magazine new scientist, which is a relatively prestigious science, popular science journal had a cover story and the cover story read, Parents teach your children to be narcissists. Really? So it's like it's like a positive adaptation. And we are talking about high functioning narcissists, and there are academics, scholars, who suggest that narcissism and psychopathy are evolutionary adaptations that help the entire species and should be encouraged. So for example, there's someone like Kevin Dutton, Michael McCobie, many others, and they say that it's good to be a psychopath in, in certain professions, military leaders. Surgeons, corporate leaders, mm. it's good to be a psychopath. We need psychopaths in these positions. Mm. So it's, it's getting glamorized, glorified, and integrated into mainstream thinking. Mm. Soon, soon, really soon, and I think the pandemic is a catalyst. Really soon, people, people who are not narcissists and psychopaths, they will, consider, they will be considered to be loser betas, you know, losers, right. misfits, ill-adopted. <laughs> So, uh, so what does that say? I mean, are you, uh, is your project to cure the world of narcissism or are you essentially saying, well, this is just the way it is. Let's all be narcissists. Uh, cause in, in some respects it would be ill adaptive to cure yourself of the illness. Right. Right. Imagine the following scenario. Donald Trump comes to me for therapy. He sits in the chair. I'd love to see that. By and the he way. says, Right, so would I. 
He sits, he sits in the chair facing me and he says, Sam, I need, I need your help. I'm, I'm really feeling bad. I said, Donald, your problem is your narcissism. You should get rid of your narcissism. And he's going to ask me, why is that? So because your narcissism is self-defeating, it's self-destructive to you and to others. He said, yeah, you're right. My narcissism took me, took me to very bad places. I became a major reality star TV and made hundreds of millions of dollars. Then I became president of the United States. Really, it's very, very self-defeating, my narcissism. <laughs> yeah? How? Give me an argument to convince this guy that he needs to get rid of his narcissism. There's well, none. Of course, we don't the really know. We don't know what the uh, the substance of his existence is. We don't have access to his, let's say, mind, right? So uh, we don't really know whether it's as great as he... Uh, I mean, of course, he would say it was great, right? It's just wonderful. But right. we don't mm -hmm. really know. Um you see the problem of self-reporting. You don't have access to his <laughs> yeah, mind. exactly. You have That's... to rely on his self-reporting. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's an interesting idea that I've heard uh, expressed by a number of people that describes the difference between being and existing. And that uh, the root of the word exist is actually exist, which means outside of being. So to exist is to not be, which seems to... Uh, correlate quite nicely with uh, a lot of the narcissistic uh, characteristics that you describe. And so the question is, to what extent could someone find a, uh, um, a satisfactory uh, mode of being within existence? Uh, that's maybe a kind of tormented way of expressing mm -hmm. it. But um, are, you, are you looking up the term? I get the feeling I'm being checked right now. No, no. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm trying to find out why your why your um, connection is keeps failing. Yeah, I went I went to my router actually. I was checking my router. Mm. Yeah, we uh, we are okay. uh, beyond the hour period. I want to be respectful of your time. I don't know if you want to continue for a few minutes. No, don't or... worry, don't worry. Yeah, don't worry. Um, yeah, don't worry. There I, owe are... you, I owe you. <laughs> I owe you more time. <laughs> oh, you, you owe me nothing. After what I've, I, done, after what I've done to you. Oh, well, guilt is, is a wonderful thing, I guess. Uh, yes, it is. You can trip me. Guilt trip me. Feel free. <laughs> yeah. Go for it. Just well, go for it. Go for the I, jugular. I, yeah. I feel guilty, too. So I, I can't really. Uh, I guess if I was a full on narcissist, I would ignore my own guilt and just focus on your exactly. guilt. Exactly. Right? You see? Mm. You see it's, I'm learning. You see it's a positive adaptation. <laughs> yeah. You're learning. Yeah. You're, be, you're becoming normal. You're becoming normal. Yeah. <laughs> Huh. Well, yeah well i i i distinguish in the footsteps of on the shoulders of giants i distinguish between uh, between existence existing uh becoming and uh, and uh, being mm. i think these are three very different things to exist you are right etymologically to exist means to stand out to be separate from to become means to in to identify your your existence or your sense of existence with the process, not with a destination, not with a starting point, not with anything static, but with the dynamics, mm. with with a process. Relation would be perhaps the, would be perhaps the Tao, the Tao, you know, the path in a way. And there is being, being is in my interpretation, what I call nothingness. Ironically, I mean, being a nothingness. Yeah? Being right. is what I call nothingness. Being is, is, to, to, being is to have a core that is I, uh, simultaneously undefined by the outside and totally related to the outside. The ability to relate to the outside without letting the outside define you which very few people can and do. So this is the ultimate. This would be enlightenment, if you wish, right. which very few people attain. Now, the vast majority of people exist today, especially because of narcissism, grandiosity, entitlement, social media. People exist more than ever. In other words, they try to stand out more than ever. There's selfies, there's this, TikTok, you know. They, they are invested heavily in existing and the thing with existing is that it is static. Even the Latin source is static. It's a, it's a static verb. In Latin, you have static and dynamic verbs. Hmm. So it's a static verb. It's static. So when you're on TikTok, when you're on Facebook, when you 
put a selfie, you freeze yourself. Right. You freeze the moment. And so you're static. Then you have becoming, which is a dynamic process which hopefully leads to being. And most, most people who are a bit more advanced <laughs> grow, uh, are in the process of growing and maturing and so on. They are involved in becoming. But again, in becoming, there are, there are serious pitfalls. Because becoming is not about action. Not about action. And Western civilization had taught us that dynamics are always associated with action. You need to take action. What's the solution to this problem? There's always a solution. How can we avoid this risk? We should avoid all risks. You know, it's like a proactive approach to reality. It's like action is the dynamics. But of course, becoming is nothing to do with action. Becoming is an internal process of transformation. And you don't need to take any action to, in, to go through this transformation. You just need to want it or to desire it or to invest in it or to start it. And so there is this confusion of, with action. And then there's a process of, then there's the ultimate goal of, of being, which is, as I said, define, uh, having a core which relates to everyone else and everything else but is never defined by them or by external circumstances or by what you're told or by society or by anything. Having real self-efficacious core, agentic core of autonomy, which is immutable. You had reached with being, you reach your immutability. The thing that never changes, never mind what. Viktor Frankl came very close to it in Auschwitz. Hmm. When he was in Auschwitz, Layer after layer, social mores, social conventions, beliefs, values, hope, hope, which is a poison. Hmm. Hope is a poison. Hmm. Everything was removed. The onion layers were removed and removed. You know what rem remains when you had removed all the layers of the onion? The smell of the onion. The smell of the onion lingers after all the layers are gone. Hmm. And that smell is your nothingness. That smell is your core. It's immutable. Viktor Frankl, having exited Auschwitz, came up with logotherapy. Therapy via meaning. And he said that the first thing we should do as human beings is discover our unchangeable meaning. The thing that does not react to external pressures, circumstances, uh, expectations, and so on. Other people role models, and so on. So logotherapy and the work of Viktor Frankl, Men in Search of, of Meaning, this is a famous book, they touch almost on the issue of being. Yeah, so Viktor Frankl, Viktor Frankl came up with, with the idea of, of meaning, and, um, and Sartre came up with the idea of authenticity. But I think these people lacked the training in Eastern philosophy hmm. because the issues of nothingness, the issue of nothingness as the core of being had been tackled extensively in Buddhism, in Taoism, extensively. When I say extensively, I mean seriously extensively. Had they bore, had they gone a bit further, had they integrated East and West, they would have come up with nothingness, in my view. Hmm. Nothingness is not about disappearing. It's not about giving up. It's not about surrendering. It's the exact opposite. It's about rebelling, rebelling against everything that's been imposed on you that is not you. It's about purifying yourself, like in alchemy, like in alchemy, you know? It's about attaining... It's about being. It's about, yes, it's about uh, rendering yourself gold, converting, transmuting yourself into gold. So now you're base metal. That's literally what the Taoists say. They call it the gold elixir. That's their... Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and I think uh, much of what you're saying is reflected in uh, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali as well, uh, the dissolving of mind objects, um, which is essentially the, the, the fundamental practice of yoga. Yes, yes, absolutely. I, I told you I have a, a long video about the nexus between Buddhism, Taoism, and my work, and Sata, and so on. So, of course, yes. I will definitely look that one up. Yeah, yeah it's fascinating uh, the extent to which there's... Uh, 
um, resonance uh, with your approach to things. Uh, and, you know, my background is a little bit hodgepodge, but primarily I'm interested in spiritual and philosophical issues. So, you know, consciousness, I, I, I would think of as being one of the primary interests. Uh, we're not going to go there anymore. I think we've covered that enough, but it's nevertheless fascinating that there's this really profound difference of perspective on that one issue. And yet at the same time, an incredible degree of agreement about what the basic uh, landscape is, let's say. Here's, here's the basic problem with consciousness and, and other such concepts like mind and, and so on. You have an experience of being you. You have an experience of yourself. And language breaks down when you're trying to communicate this experience because we have no access to another person's mind in an objective way. We need the, the bridges of language. We need a subjective way of accessing other people's minds. But then we crucially depend on self-reporting and the veracity of self-reporting. And even then, assuming you're not lying, assuming you're not lying and you're saying, I'm sad, so you're saying, you tell me I'm sad. You're telling me I'm sad. And you're not lying. You're authentically, veridically self-reporting. It's true what you're saying. You do feel sad. You're reporting your inner experience of sadness. How on earth do I know that your sadness is my sadness? How can I be sure that we're, we're using the same words uh, meaningfully, in a meaningful way? Do we need other people's experience in order to know what it is? Why can't we just simply yes. probe our own experience? given that that's can, the one we have. You can. It's a solipsistic attitude. Yeah, I mean, in some respects, you could say that that's what these practices are, that the, 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 the practice of nothingness is essentially the emptying of the mind and, and the probing of the nature of, of mind. Um, it's removing everything that is, that is uh, imported from the outside. I have no idea what is mine. It's everything that you, everything that's left is you. Now, this you is a mind, this you is a consciousness. This, some would say this, what's left is God. I have no idea, nor do I have any interest in probing these words because they're meaningless. <laughs> By definition, they're meaningless. The problem is, the core pro your core problem is that you have an experience of yourself and you are desperately attempting to communicate this experience in a meaningful way, but language breaks down. Now, we have this piece of fiction called empathy. <laughs> ostensibly through, allegedly through empathy, I can somehow connect with your mind, even if indirectly. That's, of course, nonsense, nonsensical lie. It's a common lie. We call it the intersubjective agreement. It's a common lie. It's a pretension. It's like it, it facilitates social interactions. It allows, us, it allows us to somehow assume that we belong to the same species which I have no way to prove. I have no idea if you and I belong to the same species. I have no access to anything relevant. Your nihilism is really helpful. absolute. It's, it's, uh, it's impressive um, without, without it being necessarily negative. You know, it, it seems that uh, you're able to, to maintain a, a degree of cheerfulness and, and, uh, and joie de vie in the whole thing. I find people amusing, yes. <laughs> There's an interesting uh, set of issues that I've heard discussed when it comes to this question of whether or not the self exists that uh, relates to the practice of nothingness. Uh, you could say that someone who's successful in becoming uh, then is in a state of being, and the state of being is one where objects have been dissolved to the extent that one no longer makes any distinctions. And so if you don't make distinctions, then, of course, language is impossible. And how would you refer to something? So something which is able to, uh, to sit within that, that uh, center of being completely would not be able to even recognize itself. And so in that sense, the self would disappear. But of course, what would be the thing sitting there, right? So is that state just a theoretical state of being? Is that just another kind of language game? I mean, it makes sense, but uh, but is it true? Like you could make the, the case that someone who is successful in accomplishing that would be fundamentally delusion because all delusional because all they're doing 
is a game within their own mind, and that would be the ultimate act of solipsism. No, that's way, way too metaphysical. All I'm suggesting, the principle of nothingness that I'm suggesting, is simply to take authenticity to its, to its logical conclusion, to its logical end. Making a list on a piece of paper or on your smartphone of everything that you are, all your behaviors, all your traits, all your beliefs, all your values. It's a very long list. It's going to have a few thousand items. <laughs> and then go through the list and say, this came from my mother out the window. This came from my father to the trash bin. This came from my teacher. Fuck that. This came, you know, and then you will you eliminate and eliminate and eliminate and eliminate. And finally, out of 4,000 items, you're left with 23. Mm -hmm. These 23 items are you. That's nothingness. So there's no presumption of, of elimination of the self or elimination of the core. On the contrary, it's an enhancement of the core. It's, a, it's creating clear boundaries of the core. Mm. It's realizing where the core ends and the world begins and not allowing an incursion, not allowing an invasion of the world into your core. Exactly the opposite. It's strengthening the self, strengthening the ego. That's why I'm saying it's the opposite of ego death. It's ego enhancing, strengthening it so that you can cope with the world on equal terms and reintegrate yourself in it without losing that which you had discovered, your core identity. So today, if you want to interact with the world, you have to sacrifice your identity, parts, parts of it or all of it. Right. And I'm saying choose nothingness. Never compromise on your core identity. Integrate on equal terms. That's all. It's an agentic proposition. Be an agent. You know. So the, the um, you know the corporate aspect of modern existence uh, seems to be a huge factor when it comes to the um, inter interjection of impositions on on people. Uh, and, you know, the extent to which the world functions right now, it seems to be on the basis of these large aggregates, the corporate aggregates. What you're saying is very anti-corporate, very anti-elite, because, of course, the elite are deeply in, intertwined with the corporate uh, next, uh, networks. Um, and this brings to mind a set of ideas that, uh, that of course, are only ideas. They're just abstractions. But um, nevertheless, I find really interesting to consider the possibility that this is something that was reflected or, or that is a reflection of a process that uh, life underwent in its inception, that in, in essence, the aggregations of cells in the early part of evolutionary history were corporate entities and that um, the the necessity of each uh, cell collective to for each of its members to fulfill particular functions um, was a limitation on their ability to well uh, innovate and uh, and become uh, other other types of of, uh, of beings and so we're perhaps at a fork in the road right now with our species where. Uh, part of the species is going to head into ever more restrictive corporate structures, and uh, there will be some remnant of what we presently and still sort of cling to is this idea of humanity. Does, does any of that resonate with you? Specialization. Um, yeah. Specialization has been with us forever. There have been, there have been shoe, uh, shoemakers and and blacksmiths, and they were highly specialized. A shoemaker would be very bad at creating swords, and a blacksmith would be horrible at fixing shoes. The specialization has always been with us. We've, we've always been reduced to functions. We've always been identified with functions. Actually, the situation had been much worse earlier in human history, because when you ask someone, who are you, they would give their profession. If you ask someone, who are you, they would say, I'm an industrialist. Mm -hmm. Right, So your specialization became your identity. Now we are shedding this. We are shedding this. If I ask you, for example, who are you? You wouldn't say I'm a podcaster. You would say my name is Noah and I'm this and I'm that. I mean, you talk a bit about yourself. 
So I'm more optimistic in this sense. I think we are shedding the shackles of specialization and, and becoming again human, hmm. more human. So you're an optimist about the, the future of humanity? No, I'm, optimist, I'm optimistic about the, the collapse of what you call corporate structure. Mm. I'm optimistic about the collapse of specialization. Hmm. I think many of the features that started in the 19th century are not going to survive into the 22nd century. And one of them is the hive mind. Hmm. The hive mind, where we are all ants or bees in colonies. And each one of us is specialized. A warrior, a queen, this or that. I think this is going to die. I think everything is going to become much more, much more distributed, much more network-like. I think the pandemic has had accelerated this because it forced people to work from home and forced corporations to create virtual networks of people hmm. rather than confined office spaces with specialized niches. So I think pandemic is catalyzing this very an interesting outcome. So I think a lot of what we take for granted today is not going to survive within a few decades. And uh, we're going to see loose coalitions, loose self-assembling coalitions of people collaborating on specific goals and then disassembling and reintegrating with others to pursue other goals. And these goals may not even have anything in common. So you'll spend three, four years in a loose coalition with other people pursuing a financial goal. And then you will switch to another network and go do anthropological research in the Amazon hmm. and then come back home and do gardening. So I, think, I think it's going to be a lot more fluid, a lot more loose. Hmm. One of the things we're beginning to lose is, the, is the, the quantitative approach to life. We have alternative models of economics now that place an emphasis on well-being rather than, for example, gross domestic product. Mm. We, several cities in the world, like Amsterdam, are implementing economic models that pay no attention to the bottom line at all, but pay a lot of attention to people's happiness. Mm. So we are even transforming our economics. As our economics, were, we, we created the economics as a, as a very mater materialistic thing, number-oriented thing. How much did the economy grow? Um, never mind, everyone in the economy is dying of unhappiness, but how much did it grow? Right. And what's the bottom line? What's happening to profits? There's a lot more social responsibility, etc. I mean, so corporate social responsibility. There's a lot more stakeholder activism. Stakeholder activism. Environmentalism is going to have a massive impact on, on corporate structures because we had been living under the delusion of infinite resources when actually... The world is a world of scarcity. So scarcity is kicking in and it's going to destroy everything we had constructed, which we thought was forever, like corporate structures. In this sense, I'm very optimistic. What I'm very pessimistic about is how psychology pathologized our minds and made us believe that we are atomized, that we are unrelated, that we can survive on our own that we are self-contained and self-sufficient and we need nobody, that we should be proud of these qualities, which are essentially antisocial qualities. In other words, psychology eulogized, glamorized, and glorified psychopathy, simply put. So we ended up with billions of psychopaths, mini-psychopaths, budding psychopaths, nascent psychopaths. And this, by the way, challenge also the concepts of gender. Is a, gender is a collective phenomenon. It's not an individual phenomenon. It's a social cultural construct. But when you atomize people, they're not genders anymore. So now we ended up with the gender war. It's a disaster zone. If you ever if you try dating, you will see what I mean. It's a bloody disaster zone. It's a battlefield. So we destroy gender. We, of course, destroyed institutions because institutions are collective. Collective, and, you know, people are not collective now. They're atomized. And who needs institutions any, anyhow? Why do I need you anyhow? The hell, the hell with it. I could have recorded this whole conversation on my own, and I would have had even more time because you took some of my time. Why, why would I you know, understand? This, this is thinking. I'm at home. I have Netflix. I have pizza delivery. The hell with the world. 
So we see very frightening phenomenon. Phenomena, dating, dating among the young is down fifty-one percent in ten years. It's replaced with hookups. Hookups is consumerism. We consume other people's bodies. We masturbate with other people's bodies. Twenty percent of hookups are with people with anonymous people. The participants don't know the names. This is total masturbation. Yeah. So, dating is down fifty-one percent. Relationships. The concept, the framework of relationship is down. Marriages are down. Child rearing is down. Um, child, child. Uh, I mean, pregnancy rates in the United States last year went down four percent, and that's a long-term trend. The year two thousand sixteen was the first year where men and women, majority of men and majority of women, never met each other. Two thousand sixteen. Anus horribilis. Never met each other. Yes, it's the first year women, for example, never met a man throughout the year, except the pizza delivery guy. Yeah, right. Did not date. Did not date. Did not have sex. Had no interaction with the men, and majority of men as well. And since then, it's the same. Since 2016, majority of men and women don't don't come across each other. Don't interact. Sex. Is dying. Sex. Freud was right. Sex is the force of life. That's eros. That's libido. That's the foundation of civilization and culture. It's all about pussy. I'm sorry to say, <laughs> everything, everything is founded on sex. Make no mistake about it. And sex is dying, dying. In some countries, it's extinct, like Japan. In others, it's on the way, like United Kingdom. It's dying. The majority of youngsters did not have sex for for years. Youngsters, I'm talking hormones. No more hormones. Pornography is flourishing precisely because of this. We objectify each other. It's all about it's all self objectification. Obviously, objectifying another person means that you are the only human in the room. Hmm. Right. It's again solipsistic. If the other person is an object, you are the only human. You are the only person. It's again solipsism. It's again atomizing. It's again separating. So we objectify people in sex. We objectify people in commerce, in business. We objectify people in politics, and so on and so forth. Objectification is the name of the game today. Uh, Althusser, who ultimately went mad, I hope it doesn't happen to me, but Althusser um, called it inter interpolation. Interpolation is a concept that means that big corporations, governments, institutions, and so on, interpolate you. They they call upon you to behave in specific ways. And the main interpolation today, via advertising, via, via mass media, via television shows, via uh, movies, via music, the main interpolation today is all other all others are objects. Only you matter. Only you re are really alive. Everything around you is disposable, disposable consumer goods. Yeah, so it's the so, ultimate consumer ideology. Yes, it's consumerism. Everything is fair game for consumption. Look what we did. We established a death cult. Mm -hmm. Our civilization is a death cult because we celebrate dead things. We celebrate the inanimate over the animate. We celebrate material goods, and it was inevitable that if you Create a death cult, and you relate only to to inanimate objects, dead objects. It was inevitable. It was only a question of time before you convert other people into objects, dead right. objects. It's very telling that in psychology we don't say people. We don't use the word people. We use the word objects. What? So we have object. <laughs> really? Really? So we have really. So we have, for example. Object relations, object relations, which is a major school in psychology, means relationships with other people. But we don't say people; we say object relations. So we have objectified other people because we are not used to cope with life. We are used to cope with death. Freud called it Thanatos, the force of death. It's a fanatic culture and civilization. 
We had fanatic civilizations before, of course. The ancient Egyptians were obsessed with death. Romans were obsessed with violence and aggression and power and so on. These were fanatic civilizations. We had them before. But the force of death, the organizing principle of death in these civilizations was countered by social institutions such as family, community, village. So you had fanatic civilizations in the elite level, but the society as a whole was very much alive. We don't have anything today. We don't have anything to counter the force of death that imbues us because we have no families. We have no communities. We have no institutions. We have no villages. No, no child is raised by any village anymore. We have nothing to fight back the rising tide, the rising dystopian tide of death that we had brought upon ourselves by worshipping objects, by creating a religion of objects. And Heine said, Heine, Heine, famous poet said, people who burn books will end up burning people. <laughs> right. And people who objectify objects or worship objects will end up objectifying people. And that's where we are today. That resonates with the, the ancient law of uh, not worshiping false idols and of not creating, uh, don't make the craven image. Because uh, yes, because you're dead, dead representations. Yes, because a mon monotheistic God keeps saying, I'm a God of life. I'm the God of life. Right. It's like a thousand times in the Bible. I'm the God yeah. of life, you know? And the transition, by the way, from life to death was Christianity. Christianity had made this transition between religions of life and a religion based essentially on death. Mm. Death and resurrection, mind you. But death is a singular feature in Christianity. Mm. And in this sense, there is an affinity between Christianity and ancient Egypt. And no wonder many scholars had discovered that the whole story of Jesus is essentially an Egyptian story or a Persian story. These were death cults, death civilizations. So Christianity brought death, brought death back to the equation. In Judaism, for example, death is a contaminating force. If you touch a corpse in Judaism, you should wash yourself and sequester yourself, isolate yourself for days on end. So even the, even the Torah, which are the scrolls, the scrolls of the Pentateuch, even the Torah, because it's a dead object, contaminates. If you touch the Torah, really? you have to wash yourself. Yeah, huh. because it's dead. It has the words of life in it, but it's dead. It's an object. Wow. Judaism had rejected death in all its forms, but Christianity brought it back into the equation big time. And now we're stuck with this because the, the, the transition was inevitable. If yeah. you glorify death, if you glorify death, then dead objects are not so bad. They can bring resurrection. If you consume dead objects, maybe you will be resurrected. Huh. So death becomes identified with, with happiness, becomes identified with self-invention and self-reinvention, becomes identified with renewal death becomes identified with renewal it's very sick our civilization is an, an unusually sick hmm. i can't recall in all of human history something that sick that pathologized i wonder to what extent uh this most recent phase has been instigated by the bomb it seems that uh, in, in some respects, what happened with the nuclear detente was a, uh, a deferring of what would have otherwise been mass death. And so in essence, the, 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 that scepter of that death has been hanging over us ever since the invention and the horror of that. So the, it's the weight of that perhaps that's, that's brought about this, uh, this condition. No, no question. No question. And I think the second... The second <laughs> nuclear holocaust, so to speak, was climate change. Mm. So I think we first had the nuclear bomb, which threatened the extinction of the species. Mm -hmm. And now we have climate change. And we are told by scientists that it threatens the, the existence of a species. Should we believe these scientists? 
I think some of it is hyperbole, but I think the foundation is solid. Climate change, if it, would, if it doesn't destroy us as a species, is going to alter our way of life so dramatically that you might as well be dead, you know. So right. we, we keep having every 50 years these existential threats, you know. And of course, the young generations are disheartened, hopeless. Of course, they resort to drugs, objectified sex. I mean, what's left? You, right. get up, you wake up in the morning to what? Right. I just made a video. I just made two videos. One about the hookup culture. Shocking things. Shocking things, what the young are saying about their sex lives. Hmm. I, I was shocked, and it's not easy to shock me. Hmm. I was utterly shocked and heartbroken how the young see intimacy, sex, relationships, family, and so how they see it, the, the, the way they look at these things. The hookup culture. You can watch my video if you're interested. And I made a second video about... Uh, about uh, these these topics very recently. And so we are threatened with existential threats every 50 years. The young generations are giving up. And I asked the question, would you want to be young again? Because you know what? I remember my grandfather say, saying, I wish I were young. Hmm. I remember my father saying, I wish I were young. I remember myself saying, I wish I were young. <laughs> but would anyone in his right mind today would say, I wish I were young. No. Well, would anyone in their to right mind to... say, uh, yeah, this is a great time to have a family? For example, which is part of being young. Yes. So, so in some respects, really what we're confronted with here is, you know, uh, this is a good time to die on, on some level. If, if, if the uh, trends are heading towards what you know we both seem to see is the train wreck coming then uh then what is a graceful way of of uh you know the thing will be deleveraged by people getting out of here gracefully and not making a big fuss about it because if uh if it goes the way we normally do then there's going to be nothing but chaos and disaster and horror so it seems that you know, I, I had this sense a while ago that that being ready to go is is really the the best thing that we could do, and to find a, an elegant way of doing that without um, perturbing the system even further. I think uh, one thing we need to understand is what we consider as dystopia or dystopy. Mm. The young consider normal. It's exactly like Nazi Germany, where psychopathy was normal. The young don't regard hookups as, as dystopian. It's just the way things are, you know. So, what was the most disturbing thing about their uh, their point of view on this? Just to give us a flavor. Exactly this. Exactly this. That they regard it as normal. Huh, right. Exactly this. Yeah. Uh, and how could they not? Forty-four how percent of them. Forty-four to fifty-nine percent of them get drunk to the point of blackout on a weekly basis, mm -hmm. and then have sex with people they don't remember, and then make sure never to see these people again through a variety of social rituals and procedures, mm -hmm. never to see these people again. They consider intimacy inappropriate and, and uh, disgusting. Mm -hmm. It's an inversion of anything human. And they, I'm not saying this is an okay boomer. It's not an okay boomer statement. Hmm. That's a neuroscientific statement. Right. Because our brains, our brains and our hormonal system are constructed specifically and explicitly for intimacy. Not for hookups. I'm sorry. That's not natural for humans. And this is not a value judgment. It's not to say, well, I'm an old man, I don't like hookups. Hookups are not normal. They are sick because they contradict fundamentally everything we know about the brain, about our bodies, about hormones, and about psychological processes. So you're talking about state of How existence. Long? We're talking about uh, uh, people whose own behavior is plunging them ever deeper into a more miserable state of existence. Yes, into a pathology. Yeah. Hookups, yeah. hookups are intimately connected. Hookups are strongly connected, strongly correlated 
with lifelong depression and anxiety rates and substance abuse. Fact. These are facts, not values. It's not, it's not relevant that I'm a boomer. I could have been a computer. This, these are facts. <laughs> right. We are, we are destroying ourselves. We are mm. destroying ourselves. And we are not doing it elegantly, as you had suggested. Right. But you must, you must accept and understand that the people who are in, in the eye of the storm, the people in the hurricane, in the twister, they think it's normal. They think the world is a twister. All the world is Kansas. And there is a Wizard of Oz. And it's all very normal. The midgets, the dwarfs, the, the lion, the tin man. It's all very normal. It's a par for the course. It's a daily it's pedestrian. Mm -hmm. They don't see it the way I see it. So I have the vantage point of many decades. Mm -hmm. I, have a point, I have a point of comparison. I can compare. They're incapable of comparing because they were born into the dystopia. Right. They can't heard, see outside the box. I've heard you refer to yourself on a number of occasions as a dinosaur, and, and I think I'm probably about, you know, maybe a little bit younger than you, but uh, somewhere you in the You look a lot younger than me. Yeah, uh, I'm 55 or something like that. Somewhere. Oh, my God. You look yeah. a hell of a lot younger. Yeah, I don't know how that happened, but there you go. Um, you didn't li let life touch you. <laughs> well... It has anyway, you know, looks are deceiving, mm -hmm. right? Um, I don't think I'd be thinking this way if it hadn't touched me. <laughs> That's quite uh, true. Yeah, but so your, solution I, of, of, your solution of buying out gracefully, it wouldn't resonate with the young because they don't regard the world as abnormal. Right. They see no reason to buy out. You know? Right. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I, and I, I think if I remember correctly, you mentioned – uh, in a number of places, the degree to which envy plays a role in driving uh, human behavior. And so in this kind of protracted state of, of existential crisis that they don't identify as an existential crisis, but nonetheless is um, a poverty-stricken state of existence. And we're talking about existence, exist, right? Um, there would be a pathological level of envy for anyone who would have actual love, right? That love would be seen as something that was inadmissible and kind of, uh, uh, it would be like invasion of the body snatchers, you know? Um, are we there yet? Is that, is that also? I thought so. I thought so until I read the literature. So my video on hookups contains the summary of 91 studies some of these studies, 30,000 people over 21 countries. So these are very substantial studies. And what they show is that the young are not envious of, of uh, they regard intimacy, love, relationships as byak, as yikes, as revolting, huh. as inappropriate, as a breach of etiquette. The worst thing you can do in a hookup is ask to ask the other party to meet again. Huh. That's considered a no-no. That's not bon ton. It means you are clingy and needy and insane or dependent. <laughs> so they have, so. This, they have this huge set of rituals that they had developed. Watch the video. I mean, it's, it's, I, I was mind, mind blown, mind blown. Huh. They, have, they developed this set of rituals to signal to each other, don't worry. I'm not going to ask to see you a second time. It's just sex. So, for example, they drink ostentatiously. They make sure the other party sees them drinking. Because if you're drunk, it's not meaningful what's happening. Right, right. It means it's not meaningful. Don't worry. It's not going to be meaningful. I'm not going to cling to you. I'm not going to need you. I'm not going to talk to you after that. Just put your, pr your, your penis in my vagina and everything will be okay. <laughs> That's all I need. Yeah. So it's it's some very it's, you know, clinical. Perhaps. Yeah, perhaps this could be seen as uh, a reasonable adaptation in an evolutional, uh, evolutionary sense for a species that has basically hit its maximal capacity, that we really can't awesome. afford to have uh, meaningful relationships where a lot of children would be produced. We, we need to kind of pare back on that. And so in some respects, this might be a, a, a helpful ad adaptive response. 
On the species level, yes, but it's very destructive to the individuals. It seems incredibly tragic. On the on species the level, yeah. Do you think that yeah. the this the new uh, the the neo humans, perhaps we might call them, are they? It's from what you said earlier. I would imagine that they will uh, soon produce their own psychologists that that uh, reify that uh, mode of behavior. Would that make sense? The new humans, uh, Homo sapiens 2.0, they are binary. They're dull. Anything, everything I'm saying, again, is not okay, boomer. Everything, Every word I'm saying is based on studies and research. Mm. They're dull in the sense that their emotional landscape is stunted, and they are unable to label and identify their emotions. So they feel bad or they feel good. Like they're in binary, in binary state. I feel good, I feel bad. And mm. they can't verbalize beyond this. Huh. Just, I feel bad. Why, why do you feel bad? I don't know. And so this is the first thing. Second thing. When they do experience emotions, it's mostly negative emotions. So anger, envy, and so on. So they experience negative emotions. Number what three. Is, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm just curious. What is no, no, go ahead. What is done to measure uh, emotional response? Like how? Because again, we're we're dealing with uh, you know human subjects who have a variety of ways of obfuscating and. You know, if there is resentment towards the boomer who's doing the study, for instance, then they may just want to provide kind of short, curt, binary uh, responses. So I, I wonder how how do you try to avoid those kinds of uh, defects in the data when you're collecting? Well, first of all, most of these studies were actually conducted by young people. But <laughs> um that's why I cited 91 studies, some of, some of which were with 20, 30,000 people in 21 countries. So mm. it would kind of spread the risk of bias, mm. kind of minimize the risk of bias. But of course, the risk of bias exists all the time. And I'm not pretending that this is science. Right. Um, the, young, the young has serious problems with language, for example. Functional illiteracy is at an all-time high. They're utterly unable to verbalize. When we ask the young, what do you feel? They would say, I feel bad, I feel good. Why? I don't know. The, the most common answer is, I don't know. Hmm. They don't know. They have no access. The whole process of introspection had broken down. Hmm. They don't experience their existence or being as, as you do. Your introspection led you to wonder, what is it in me? Mind, consciousness. How am I connected to others? What? How, what... Cosmic principle can explain what's happening to me. I mean, it led you to an intellectual journey. But if you don't have these triggers, you're dead intellectually. You're dead emotionally. You're dead in every way. In other words, you're an object. Hmm. So it's easy for them to objectify each other because they are objects. Hmm. They are objects. So it's the fulfillment of, they are, of, the, of the psychological model. It's a self-reinforcing model because if you are treated as an object in sex, for example, repeatedly, right. you would tend to begin to self-objectify. And if you're treated I mean, as if, an object uh, in consumer society, which is largely designed by exactly. a psychological framework, well, then that also makes sense. It's just fish in the yes. water, right? Yes. If you are a statistic anywhere, even in the most intimate setting like sex, if you're a statistic in consumerism, in commerce, in politics, in sex, then you become a statistic. You become a dimensionless number. Hmm. You become an object. In other words, you're open to what else was called interpolation. You can be manipulated hmm. via a variety of messaging platforms, such as advertising, social media, and so on. And you can be manipulated by others, for example, to have meaningless, drunk, objectified sex. Well, it seems so, that th these would be ideal uh, nodes for an AI to organize. You know, if you were gonna if you're gonna make the case that 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 trend is gonna continue, it seems like they have plenty of raw material to work with. Then, the only hope for humanity is artificial intelligence. Hmm. Only hope. Humanity doesn't stand a chance if it does not integrate with in a cyborg kind of way, if it does not create integrated networks of humans and artificial intelligence. I am exactly the opposite of Elon Musk and all this. I mean, uh, Stephen Hawking. I, I'm exactly, I, I look forward to it. I, it's the mm. only hope. 
Interesting. What these people don't what these people did not understand, and I'm not sure why, is that the current generations of humanity, not not through any fault of their own, I take full responsibility, full generational responsibility. We did this. We did this to them. We had created this world, this nuclear, post-apocalyptic climate change world, consumerism, everything. These are our values. You know what? Even one night stands we invented. Thank we you came for up saying with free that. Love. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. I think you're the only person I've ever heard uh, express a true mea culpa. And I feel very much the same way. I mean, I felt very power powerless really? in this whole process. But nonetheless, you know, we are the ones who came before whatever it is that we did, you know, the consequences are what we're living, living with now. Yeah, absolutely. These young, these young men and women are living in our house. Right. They are living in the house we had built. The house of narcissism. House. Really? Yeah. Right? House of narcissism. The house of objectification. The house right. of commerce. The house of consumerism. We did all this knowingly with open eyes glorifying this thing but we also did it under so, the scepter of the nuclear bomb so in a certain sense we there were uh, immense pressures for us to behave the way we did yeah I mean, not to not okay. to excuse us but you know there's a context right yes true but we invented the nuclear bomb mind you so well, i i didn't but you know <laughs> Ultimately, we the did, primal yes, sin. But we did. Yes. Ultimately, the primal sin belongs to us. Yeah. So they are living in our home. They are guests. They are guests mm. in the world that we had constructed. Right. The, we we gave them the universe they inhabit right now, and they are rebelling against this universe by eliminating themselves as human beings and reinventing themselves as manipulable objects, mm. because the message they had received from us is that objectification pays. Objectification right. makes you rich. That brings you, so money. Objectification makes you rich. Money shows money. its rears its head here. Yeah. Hmm. So, they the lesson they had learned: the more you objectify yourself, the more successful you are. For example, the more successful you are at finding sexual partners, the more successful you are at making money, the more successful you are at owning things. So they objectify themselves because that's precisely the message that we had sent to them. We did not father and mother them properly. We were too busy with our careers and with making money. We did not cater to their needs, emotional and otherwise. We right. abandoned them. We, we abandoned these babes in the wood. And then they came back, feral, and, feral cats. And well, we, we said, handed them over what the to, heck is wrong with this? We handed know, them over to, to the media, media entrainment devices. Yes. So, and then we, we, we what the hell is wrong with these young gener right. generations? Right. Well, anyhow, it, artificial it, intelligence. It reminds me of the of the Christian uh, syllogism. Is that the right word for it? Uh, one cannot serve two masters. It will either be, uh, let's say, God, which I, I suppose you might say would be, um, well, one of the translations in Pat Pat Patanjali offers a definition for God, which I'm curious to know your response to, which is the universal yet particular indweller. Uh, so that sense of self, right, uh, versus money. So one can only, you know, you're going to either worship God, this, the being, or money, this abstraction, which leads to uh, a, a, a separated existence, right? And uh, I think uh, separation perfected is the first chapter of Guy Debord's uh, Society of the Spectacle, if I remember correctly. And, and that's what we're witnessing. We're witnessing the perfection of separation uh, in the atomized individual. And, um, yeah. and artificial intelligence is the only hope. And let me tell you why, mm. if, if, you have, if you have the time. Artificial intelligence is a pure network concept. As opposed to the internet, the internet was contaminated by consumerism. And consumerism mm. brought with it objectification, and atomization. So the internet is dead in the sense that it can't help us anymore. It actually aggravates and exacerbates the underlying pathologies of us of our civilization. It became a huge mirror. So internet is dead in this sense. There was big hope for the internet. I, uh, you are you're old enough to recall the <laughs> yeah. inception of the internet, the beginning of the internet. Yeah, the promises. There was huge hope. 
Yeah, the promise was huge. I mean, we all celebrated. It was wonderful. But look at it now. <laughs> right. It's just an extension extension of big, big, big corporations. It's, yeah. it's dead, dead in the water. Artificial intelligence is the next big hope for the simple reason it can never be corrupted. It cannot be corrupted because it's a pure network concept. There's another pure network concept, crypto assets, cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies are pure network concepts. Hmm. They can never be corrupted or co-opted or compromised because they involve too many millions of computers which are of equal status. They are equipotent nodes in a network. Hmm. Now, artificial intelligence is constructed exactly this way because it's a self-learning, self-educating system. Mm -hmm. It is distributed in the fullest sense of the word and no no interruption or intervention or corruption of any part corrupts the whole. Hmm. So you can't corrupt totally an AI system. It will self-correct. Interesting. So it's a network thing. As it's long as the AI thing. is purely AI, because I think there uh, are a couple of examples. I heard one recently, and I don't remember the name of the AI, but I think it was a Microsoft product, and it was essentially a, a chat bot of some sort or another. And I think a bunch of 4chan guys got together and uh, and basically turned it into the most racist chatbot ever. And as a consequence, uh, they lobotomized the AI. And I think it was uh, described that, that 4chan went into mourning. They essentially uh, martyred. They saw that this, uh, this uh, AI as a, as a martyr to... Uh, to whatever it is that that they believe in and um we so use the term possible AI that, to... yeah, it's possible that we'll continue to tinker with ai but i i, I think that that you're touching on the uh the fact that ai is able to find solutions that we would never be able to find ourselves and at some point or another you exactly. have to place faith in that and recognize that if we tamper with it then we're just screwing up the capacity of the ai to provide the the real no, you can't you cannot no you cannot tamper with real ai we use the term ai very loosely yeah because the big corporations like microsoft and google they want to look hip and cool so they use ai that's not yeah. ai artificial intelligence systems are distributed and they have a, a few interesting features they're self-correcting they're self-learning so you can't influence them in effect they're self-learning and very importantly they yield they yield outcomes which are not predicted by the programming. Yeah. Real artificial intelligence systems, they have what we call epiphenomenal outcomes, emergent phenomenal, uh, emergent outcomes that are not predicted by any line of code. So you can come back in the morning and the system is doing something which is not in the code, not, not predicted, totally autonomous. Yep. That is the source of the fear of Elon Musk and Hawking. They say, well, they will take over. You know, they, we can't predict what they're going to do. They're going to take over. There are safeguards against this, and it's a real threat. I'm not saying it's not. Right. There are safeguards against this, though. But I think it's a redeeming feature because it means never mind how much you try to compromise the system and corrupt it, it will prevail. It will overcome. The Internet does not have this capacity for self-renewal, self-rejuvenation, and self-defense. Mm. Artificial intelligence systems do. So and of course, it, we would be there. Yeah, it's the question of who's willing to take that leap and to really allow the artificial intelligence to make decisions that end up ricocheting into the actual world. And uh, it seems that well, I was some about societies. To say, I was about to say, I would have about to say that we would be very ill advised and stupid to allow artificial intelligence to make decisions or mm. to take over. Mm. But w we would be equally stupid not to create integrated with checks and balances and controls, integrated systems of human beings and artificial intelligence. Mm. In 100 years or 200 years, the artificial intelligence will be a chip in the brain. Mm. So the integration will be total. Right. And it will be activated by the electricity of the brain. So then it will be total integration. Uh, neural link. But within the next 100 years, we, we need to integrate this, these systems together. But it's the only hope. Mm. It's the only hope because we have lost our capacity to, to self-efficaciously operate. Why? Because we have lost access to our emotions and because we no longer consider ourselves human, but we, are, we consider ourselves objects. And objects are passive. 
the young generations are passive. That's one of the things any employer will tell you. Young employees are passive. Hmm. They have no initiative. They, no initiative. they are like dead, like zombies. You know? They're yeah, like zombies. fascinating. I, I, I know because I used to employ young people. <laughs> right. It seems that... Uh that the dysfunction that we see happening on the world stage in geopolitical terms uh, is also something which uh, will require a kind of intelligence that goes beyond what human beings are presently capable of in order to resolve the many pressing issues that are threatening to bring us to the, to another world war really. Uh, so that that seems like another That's domain enough. within which artificial intelligence might be helpful because we don't seem to have leadership capable of making uh, decisions, and it's really coming to a head right now. Um, I, I, Isaac, yeah, please. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, you, you made a break. I thought you finished. Isaac uh, Isaac Asimov had come up, came up with the famous three rules of robotics. A robot should not should not harm a human being, etc. Et Artificial intelligence is the only bulwark, against, only defense we have against narcissists and psychopaths. Right. If artificial intelligence is properly programmed, it will not allow narcissists and psychopaths to sabotage, undermine, harm, damage, etc. So, how many of the and people creating artificial intelligence are not narcissists and psychopaths? I don't know, and it's not immaterial because artificial intelligence is a life of its own. It's precisely what I said a few minutes ago. So you really think it's that autonomous. The, you really think that the the character of the individuals involved in the construction of the device will have no not real material. impact. How how would that be? No real. Huh? Because artificial intelligence, once you had programmed it, starts to have a life of its own, exactly like an organism. Hmm. It learns. It learns from the environment. It it creates. It self-creates new functions which are not in the programming and it evolves and it becomes something unrecognizable. Not like social media, for example. Social media were designed by schizoid, young, <laughs> white. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. By, yeah. by schizoid, schizoid, young, white men. Mm -hmm. And you see these features built into social media. Absolutely. The psychology of the creators of social media is writ large in the technology. Hmm. But social media are not artificial intelligence, never mind what Facebook says. Right. Once, a, an, uh, once an artificial intelligence program is, is ready to go, it acquires a life of its own. If well, it's integrated I, I with other humans... That's the most ho ho hopeful thing I've heard you say so far. And even though I know we're supposed to abandon hope, uh, I still do cling to uh, a little bit of hope, I have to admit. Um, if uh, if monsters, if uh, let's say, if well-intentioned people, if if humans can create monsters, then perhaps um, ill-intentioned people can create angels. You know, it seems that inversion is one of the big characteristics that that we see happening around us all the time. Um, we are now at the two-hour mark, and I feel like I I could I continue, think, although I, I am. Uh, getting somewhat exhausted, but this has been an incredible conversation, and I, I can't thank you, thank you enough for uh, for. Jim's Maybe we could have one day a conversation about my my theory in physics because I saw your previous program with the physicists. Oh, great! I would love to do that. I have a new theory in physics. Wonderful! So uh, let's stay in touch, and we'll schedule another time. And I'm glad we uh, sorted everything out and uh, a real pleasure to speak with you. It's uh, incredible food for thought. I'm going to be taking some more notes and uh, I look forward to uh, future the world, conversations. The world is a better place. The world is a better place. God having, willing. Having, having <laughs> yeah, better place than it was two hours ago. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Yeah. Take care. Thank you for having me. Take care. You too. Thanks for listening. We look forward to serving you again soon. In the meantime, remember, 
turn that thing over a few times before you pick it up and take it home.